Yesterday I decided to turn myself invisible to surprise a friend. And as you can see, I'm still invisible. I really don't want to talk about it, it's a very awkward story. I've mastered the ability of standing so incredibly still that I've become invisible to the eye. No! God, please, no! No! Welcome back to Torn Apart. If you're new here, I'm so glad to see you. I hope I make a really good first impression. A couple of weeks ago, so I might even say a year ago, I mentioned that I wanted to make a video about animated movies and specifically about animated movies that are aimed at an adult audience. And I consider myself an adult, even though I'm clearly making a shitty childish joke by pretending to be invisible when in fact I'm just recording a voiceover. He said that wherever I went, he would find me, walk right up to me, and I wouldn't be able to see him. He has figured out a way to be invisible. <gasps> It's kind of funny because it feels like we are obsessed with adult humor in animated things these days. The pizza at the bagel in the apartment in the coffee. Oh, yeah, yeah. An intruder! <laughs> I've talked a lot about Bojack Horseman on my channel, but we also have things like South Park, Archer, Rick and Morty, or even Love, Death and Robots if you want a weird mix in between animation and mocap technology. By the way, small break here to point out the fact that the CGI work in some of the Love, Death and Robots short stories is better than Avatar Way of the Water. Patrick, can you shut the fuck up? I know, it's a hot take, but I will elaborate on that at the end of the video, so stay tuned. We also have things like Disenchantment, Futurama, Castlevania, Robot Chicken, the list goes on and on, but have you noticed all of these are TV shows? Wow. So, when I was writing this video, I stopped for a second and I tried to name some adult animated movies. And I'm not talking about porn. I begged them to stop, but they, ah! they just wouldn't. First the god stretched me till it hurt. And they went inside me and then, and then, Spooge! Any movie, but my mind was blank. In fact, try it out yourself. I will give you five seconds of elevator music so you can start typing down in the comments some adult animated movies. Ready? Wait, 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 wait a second. There is a rule. Anime movies don't count. Oh, come on! Yeah, I made everything much harder, am I right? Okay, starting from now, five seconds, go. So as I was saying, I had a really hard time, so an idea started sprouting in my head. And I love this word, sprouting. It's such a creative, pretentious word. Bell People who have a bell sprout bell type personality bell are very bell passive bell and are easily swayed by the opinions of others. That's a lot of junk! So, if what if I recommended some non-Disney, non-Pixar, non-anime, adult animated movies to you? Great idea, right? We could even turn this into a TV show, why not? One other problem though, I didn't want it to be mainstream, I wanted to be special because I'm one of those really special white boys. Because it would have been really easy to recommend things made by the stop motion Laker studio for example, Coraline is a good example, I think it counts it, since it's creepy as fuck, or even Wes Anderson's Isle of Dogs at the end of the day, or things like last year's The House, which was yet another weird stop motion animated movie, so no. It had to be something new, something weird, and most of all I wanted to prove one thing, that Disney made such a big name for themselves that they slowly overshadowed a huge part of animation history to the point that we've forgotten about it. So I scouted the internet looking for different lists like best adult animated movies, essential watches for animators, nichest animated movies, weirdest animated movies, and slowly I came up with a list of 20 movies and today I'm gonna recommend five of those. Let's start with Fantastic Planet, which is known in France as La Planète Sauvage. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a 1973 experimental science fiction film directed by René Laloux and written by Laloux himself and also Roland Topor. The first thing we can say about it is that it definitely looks weird, but it also seems to be obsessed about the human body, especially its nudity, but also sex just in general. And this is something we can say about most of the independent animated movies of the 70s and the 80s. They were trying to break boundaries and show things that Disney simply couldn't or wouldn't. But what is this weird movie about? Well, we are in a distant future and the gargantuan blue homanoid called the Trags. Gargantuan is yet another word that I don't know the meaning of and I will not pretend that I do. But anyways, these weird sci-fi dudes, basically they have brought human beings from Earth to the planet Egam, where they maintain a technological and spiritually advanced society. G Trags consider Oms animals and while they keep some as pets, others live in the wilderness and are periodically slaughtered by the Trags to control the population. The final result is an odd psychedelic journey with an ominous French dubbing which almost makes the film look like a documentary. Que valait un enfant d'homme comparé à l'extraordinaire importance de la méditation, ce rite étrange auquel mes maîtres consacraient le meilleur de leur temps et qui semblait le sujet essentiel de leurs préoccupations. Something also that gets really close to the movies made by Alejandro Jodorowsky around the same time. But if you want to talk about Avatar once again, the team behind Fantastic Planet created entirely new ecosystems that look like nothing you've ever seen. And the result is one of the weirdest and most beautiful animated movies of the 70s. And weirdly enough, it kind of reminds me of the absurd stop-motion work in the Monty Python movies as well. To give you some context, every single time I talk about a new film, I will tell you what kind of movies Disney slash Pixar was making at the same time, so that you can compare. For example, around that time we had The Sword in the Stone, which came out in 63, The Jungle Book, which came out in 67, and The Aristocats, which came out in the 70s. Pixar actually was starting to be created around 79, but as we know, the first actual movie was Toy Story in 1995 so we can't really take Pixar into consideration right now but anyways as you can see all of these are considered as undeniable animated classics but why do you ever stop and ask yourself why because I find Fantastic Planet a hundred times more interesting than those three put together hey 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 look at this big fucking gun <laughs> We're moving now to the US with the movie Fritz the Cat which came out in 72 and was written and directed by Ralph Bakshi in his feature film debut. The movie is based on the comic strip by R. Crumb and starring Skip Hennant and focuses on Fritz, a glib. If you know what the hell a glib is, let me know in the comments. I keep using these words, but I don't know what they mean. Who is basically a womanizing and fraudulent cat in an anthropomorphic animal version of New York City during the mid to late 60s. This weird cat decides on a whim to drop out of college, interacts with inner-city African-American crows, unintentionally starts a race riot and becomes a leftist revolutionary. Ritz the Cat is kind of like Bojack Horseman before it was cool to be an anti-hero. It is really a weird movie to experience in 2023, but I also think that behind the offensive sexist jokes, there might be some of the most inspired social metaphors that I've ever seen from a pre-2000 animated movie. And it's even weirder to say that some of this movie's themes still feel very relevant today, White people playing the savior character when it comes to black issues without risking their lives, for example, or even idealists and anarchists being swindled by radical extremists just because they push the right buttons. I mean, I will be the first to admit that Fristo Cat is far from being a perfect film. In fact, it's often offensive, but not in a fun way, but it is also definitely thought provoking and it made a huge impact on pop culture and the future of adult animation. For example, you can't really miss the parallels with the other 90s now cult TV shows like like The Simpsons, South Park, Beavers and Butthead, or even Family Guy. As a fun fact, I will let you know that the MPAA gave the film an X rating, making it the first American animated film to receive that rating, but besides that, it was still highly successful, grossing over 90 million worldwide, making it one of the most successful independent films of all time. And personally, I love that shit. Indie movies making a lot of money, give me that shit 
every single day. For this movie, I will skip the Disney comparison because first of all, we are in the same time span, but also because Fritz the Cat is the kind of movie that really wants you to know that it is a satire of Disney movies. So I don't really feel like I need to point it out even more. If there's one thing I, I, I've learned, it's, it's, it's you get over here and you get down there like that. And now you blonde, you get under here. Like that. That's right. We're going back to Europe again with the movie Son of the White Mare, or in its Hungarian title Ferlofia, and I hope I pronounced that right, which came out in 1981 is directed by Marcel Jankovic. The story's main character is Ferlofia, who has superhuman powers and who tries to save three princesses from hell with the help of his brother. Annak volt egy felesége. Meg három szép szálfia. It is based on the narrative poetry under the same title from Laszlo Arani and ancient Hunnic, Avaric and Hungarian legends and it is presented as a tribute to, to ancient steppe people. Funny enough, you will see a lot of parallels with other Disney movies, things like 1997's Hercules for example, where some sequences and creature designs feel like straight on more polished copies from Son of the White Mare. I honestly didn't know there could be such beautiful animation in the 80s. I grew up with movies like The Land Before Time or all dogs go to heaven, which were impressive as well, but nothing could prepare me for something like this. We're going back to something very primal that almost reminds me of the very first pixelated arcade games. This has to do mostly with the format of the film itself, which is almost square. The color palette of this film feels like going back to the first avant-garde animated works of Len Lai or even Mary Ellen Boot, but at the same time it is a very tight narrative, clear characters and it resonates across the ages. I'm also pretty sure this movie is the origin story of Tartakovsky's work. Some scenes look exactly like things I've seen in Samurai Jack. It is probably one of his biggest inspirations. Meanwhile, what is happening at Disneyland, right? We've got Robin Hood, which came out in 73, The Rescuers, which came out in 77, and The Fox and the Hound, which came out in 81. Pixar is still not born yet. It's still in its creator's belly, I suppose. Once again, in the popular culture, these three films are considered as iconic, but I really wanted to ask yourself why. And this time around, I will answer that question for you. Is it because you have some sense of nostalgia about them, or is it maybe just because they were widely available at the time, and you simply had no access to other animated movies? Personally, I think the latter is more true. Watching this film made me really interested in the work of Marcel Jankovic. I really want to check out more of his films like Johnny Corncob or The Tragedy of Man, which is his last film and underwent 23 years in production and at 160 minutes of length it is currently the longest animated film in the western world crazy shit this guy is next level. But anyways, discovering this film mostly made me even more aware of the fact that there is so much more animation out there to be discovered. For example, did you know that by the late 70s, Pannonia Film Studio, which is the company behind Son of the White Mare, ranked among the top five major cartoon studios alongside Walt Disney, Anna Barbera, the Russian Soyuz Mult film, and the Japanese studio Toy. But almost no one talks about that, and I find that insane. I also heard that there is a 4K restoration which was done on the film itself by the Los Angeles based studio Arbelos Films and that is probably now available for purchase and if you're a collector of physical media I really recommend it because this movie really 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 gets so much better with that 4k restoration. We're going back to France and beyond the threshold of the year 2000 with the movie The Triplets of Belleville, also called Les Triplets de Belleville. I meant Les Triplets de Belleville.
there. Now it sounds French. Which came out in 2003 and it is written and directed by Sylvain Chaumet and it's also his feature debut. And once you start seeing some images from it, you will know how crazy that sounds. There is little dialogue in the movie itself, but I think this makes the movie even more universal and much of the narrative is conveyed through song and pantomime. I know what pantomime means, don't look at me like that. It's classic Charlie Chaplin shit. The Triplets of Belleville tells the story of Madame Souza, an elderly woman who goes on a quest to rescue her grandson champion, a Tour de France cyclist, who has been kidnapped by the French Mafia for gambling purposes and taken to the city of Belleville. This is not really a niche film when you think about it, mostly because it was nominated for two Academy Awards, Best Animated Feature and Best Original Song as well. It was also screened out of competition at the 2003 Cannes Film Festival, but I still haven't met a single person person on earth who has talked to me about it, so yes, it sits perfectly well within my list of forgotten animated films. Around the same time with Disney Pixar, we had somewhat of a tough competition, but mostly because of Pixar, which was finally born. It's been gestating for so long and now it's there with us. So we had movies like Toy Story 1 and 2, A Bug's Life, Monsters Inc, and Finding Nemo. And even with Disney, we had a bit of a golden age for them as well, because we have things like The Emperor's New Groove in 2000, Treasure Planet 2002, and Atlantis The Lost Empire in 2001. But at the same time, we're in an era of Disney Pixar, which I would call kind of glossy. The movies are colorful and exciting, but they really like the details that we had with hand-drawn animated movies, like the 101 Dalmatians, for example. In fact, that is actually a great comparison because I think that the color palette, but also the visual style of the triplets of Belleville is really inspired by that. What I love about it the most is that for a movie that came out in 2003, it feels completely out of time. It's kind of like a silent movie, but it is also incredibly detailed to the point that every frame becomes a painting you want to hang on your walls. And it really pisses me off, for example, that a movie like Finding Nemo would end up winning the Academy Award that year instead of this one. Even though fish are friends and not food, of course. I stand by that still to this day. Put the shrimp down! <laughs> We're getting to my final recommendation for today, which is a movie that is much closer to reality and it really showcases the power of animation when it comes to depicting real events. And I'm of course talking about Waltz with Bashir, which came out in 2008 and is an Israeli animated war documentary drama film which is written, produced, and directed by Ari Fulman. And basically it depicts Fulman's search for lost memories of his experience as a soldier during the 1982 Lebanon war. Remember when people used to say Grave of the Fireflies was the most gorgeous, soul-breaking animated movie of all time? Well, this has the second place. Some of the darkly lit scenes remind me of Mike Mignola's work, Max Richter's music is mesmerizing and so heartbreaking, and the writing is simply put excellent. I really like the idea of slowly retracing the context of the Lebanon civil war as our main character finds his memory back but since it is a conflict I haven't studied at all I find myself quite often lost not understanding why people were fighting or what was the big picture in just in general but that is a tiny flow in contrast to the heartbreaking beauty of the movie that we have here and this time around it really completely beats Disney and Pixar <laughs> אתה תלך עם אשתי כל לפני הכוח, ותראה רק לבי. עשרים ושישה כלבים. אני זוכר כל אחד מהם. 
Disney was producing movies like Chicken Little 2005, Meet the Robinsons 2007 and Bolt in 2008, while Pixar was producing things like The Incredibles, Cars from 2006, Ratatouille from 2007 and Wall-E from 2008. I mean, don't get me wrong, Wall-E and The Incredibles are great movies, that's undeniable. But they are following the same trend set up by Disney and Pixar before it. They might excite me, they might be incredibly entertaining, but they don't really surprise me anymore. Of course, let's not even talk about the Disney movies that came out around the that time. I mean, both Meet the Robinsons and Chicken Little are without a doubt among the most forgettable movies that I've ever made. Okay, time out! So... <laughs> Like but I don't know, I mean, Walls of Bashir just hit me differently. It actually felt like a movie. It used animation to portray things that wouldn't have worked as well in live action mode. And for me, that is exactly the purpose of animation. Exactly why it exists and why we need to consider it more and more when it comes to Academy Awards when it comes to other competitions worldwide. It needs to be taken seriously, mostly because it can expand our horizons and showcase things we've never seen before or that we could never have imagined with our own imagination. Hoo-ha! Check it out! A dimension where hats wear people! Mm hmm. Of course, I know that within animation history, there have been a lot of companies which were born in opposition to Disney's content, and Pixar is literally the first one that we can mention, even though it's been bought by Disney later on. But a really excellent example would be the movies produced by Don Bluff, animation studio, things like An American Tale or The Secret of Nim, but also bigger companies like DreamWorks, which was created to actively produce movies that looked and felt different from the things that we saw with Disney. Get out of my swamp! <laughs> and stand there! And then I saw her face. Thanks, Shrek. You're welcome, Wendy. But when you think about it, there are not that many companies which only produce animated movies for adults. No one really specializes in that and I think it's kind of weird. It's really weird that adult animated movies are still things that exist within a very niche and art house environment, especially because animation has the power to create so many fascinating new environments and situations that don't work as well in live action. To end this video, I can finally briefly talk about Avatar The Way of the Water again, which is almost an animated movie when you think about it. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! Or at least, we can all admit that it exists in that weird limbo where movies like Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Space Jam live. Avatar 2 might not be the future of live action cinema, but it might open the market for adult animated movies and for them to be taken more seriously. And I think at the end of the day, that's a good thing. But of course, James Cameron will never allow that because he probably thinks that calling Avatar an animated movie is some kind of weird insult. But let me know what you think down in the comments. If you'd like more the weird recommendation, let me know and I could make a sequel to this video and maybe, even maybe, I could find a cure for invisibility and show you my face. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Every single like that you drop will go to the special effects artists who made me invisible for this episode of Torn Apart. Yes, I am committing to my bit until the very last second of this video. Sue me. Thank you. Give them some love and compassion because they had to delete my face from every single frame of this video. And if you're a subscriber, you know how ugly my face is. I'm Patrick, and this is Torn Apart. Ta-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-